welcome to the OnFIF podcast. My name is Lewis McClellan. I'm the editor of the Digital Monetary Institute here at OnFIF, and today I'm delighted to be joined by newly appointed executive chair at RTGS Global, Marcus Treacher, with whom I'm going to be discussing some of the key issues in cross-border payments and RTGS's global strategy for addressing them. Marcus, great to have you here today. Thank you for joining us. That's super. Thank you for um, inviting me on the, um, the podcast today. A um, bit of background. So RTGS Global is a, a fintech startup company based in London with offices around the world. Um, our purpose is to create um, a much more effective way of moving money between countries for banks all around the world. Excellent, thank you. And uh, as, as I mentioned, you're the newly appointed executive chair there. Can you tell us about your vision for the business in the, in the short, medium, long term? Certainly. So in the short term, we are onboarding our first banks, our first customers, and the goal is to get them transacting. So we're using the network between countries to enable these banks to settle much more effectively than they can do today. And that will run from now through to the end of, let's say, first quarter next year. The midterm goal is to extend that network globally. So what we want to do is to reach a point where every bank in the world can connect to RTGS Global and, and, and have those benefits of being able to move money immediately for their customers from one currency to another between any currencies in any country around the world. And long term, once we have that network in place, it creates great opportunities to um, develop new product, new services, both RTGS Global services or as a, a platform, if you like, for other providers, whether they are security, um, KYC providers, um, trade services or, um, you know, e-commerce services to build new propositions that benefit from having that immediate movement of value that our platform creates. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. That's uh, that's very interesting. And I mean, the cross-border payments market. Um, we've seen a lot of improvements in domestic payments uh, over the past, you know, fifteen twenty years. Things have become very efficient there. Uh, it seems to me that uh, the, there there are more persistent problems with with cross-border payments. Uh, improvements seem to be slower there. What? Why is that? And why has no one fixed this yet? The key problem is it's called liquidity. So when a bank or a payment company is um, carrying out a payment for you domestically, all the money required to move that value between you, the payer, and whoever you are paying is already in the banking system in the UK in the right place. And that means that banks can move that money immediately. That's why we have that experience domestically of clicking our app the payment happening or tapping our phone on a um a device and the the door to the um uh, the underground in my case in london opening and i go in when you go and try that cross border you get the extra challenge of actually placing that money in the right account in the right currency in time for that payment to happen for the payment to move from the person paying let's say in the uk in pounds to the person receiving, for example, in Brazil's and Brazilian reals. And that process is um, difficult. It takes time. It's expensive. It often goes wrong. And it ties up trillions of dollars of um, bank capital every day in um, accounts around the world, only placed in order to make payments happen. And that's the core reason why when you try and move from a domestic model that works quite quickly and is efficient, never goes wrong, to a cross-border model, you suddenly get all those problems. You get the, um, the where's my money uh, questions, you get my um, you know, the, the overhead problem, you get the high charges, you get the delays, and it's all because of that cross-border movement of liquidity, um, which is a factor of moving between currencies and countries. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, and well, tell us about RTS Global's approach there. You mentioned that's the, the problem you're trying to solve. What, what's, uh, I guess, different about the, the approach to cross-border settlement that, that you're providing? Our solution enables the, the funding required, the placing of that liquidity to happen immediately and what we call atomically. And that means that the, the money is moving between the currency that the payment is starting at to the currency that, that the payment is going to end at immediately and without any half payment problem. So if you're making a payment in the UK again, um, thousand pounds, that thousand pounds will only move if at the other end of the flow, let's say in Brazil again, or in the USA, the, um, the equivalent of dollars have moved as well. So we make the whole transaction atomic and we also have a revolutionary way of thinking about that, that liquidity so that we can make that movement happen at any point in time, any time of day, any day of the working week, and ultimately to any value. Excellent. Okay, yeah, that's very exciting. Um, there's a lot of work going on in the digital asset space, and, and the term you use there, you know, atomic settlement and uh, delivering it 24-7, these are often uh, features that people have as benefits of using a stable coin or a cryptocurrency uh, or well, a CBDC where, where those exist yet. Um, what, what's your attitude to, to, to that work and uh, how would the RTS global system interact with that kind of asset? Yeah, we are big, big supporters of the, the CBDC and the, the stable coin movement. So they're very good ideas anyway to put much more intelligence into money and that can be put to good in many ways domestically and worldwide. For RTGS Global, it helps us realize the key value proposition that we have of immediate cross-border flow without risk um, and immediate settlement because the nature of a CBD or a stable coin is that the value you hold if you buy or if you are given a CBDC isn't linked to the health of the bank that that money is held by. So what I mean by that is if you are working with money that's held by even large banks around the world, they could collapse, there could be problems. You remember 2008 back in the day, um, more recently, a spate of collapses um, mid-tier US banks driven by the, uh, the shift in interest rates. So traditionally, one of the reasons why, as I was describing, that the movement of liquidity between the originating currency and the payout currency is so difficult is that when banks move that money, they're having to place it with other banks in different parts of the world who they see as risky, who they have to regard as a risk, because those banks could have problems. If you're a UK bank, you don't know if your Malaysian or Australian counterpart bank is going to have a problem. So part of our model is to either insure those funds or more powerfully hold them with central banks, what's called central bank money. So central banks generally do not collapse. They are the currency. The UK central bank is the pound, the Bank of England. So they're ultra safe parties to be working with. So we're working with central banks to develop ways, we've made applications to many of them, to hold our value on behalf of our bank customers with central banks. What's interesting about CBDCs is you can do that um, much more efficiently because in effect, the central bank is saying, here's a an item of currency, that item is intrinsically safe. No matter who's holding it, it's just there. So if we can deliver a transaction from a CBDC in one country to a CBDC in another, let's say digital pounds to digital rupees and make this up, then those assets themselves, digital pound, the CBDC and the CBDC in India are intrinsically safe no matter where they're held. And that means that we can connect in our atomic settlement and the whole thing flows immediately. So we think they're really powerful ideas. And actually we are quite close to piloting a connection to a CBDC um, capability 
with a major player in the industry. So more on that later, if we can uh, deliver, mm. deliver on that, that'll be super for what we're doing. Mm, very exciting. So you, you can still do the the atomic settlement uh, without that, but I guess it's it's more direct if you're connecting CDCs and, and central bank currency rather than commercial bank money. It makes it faster. Um, and actually, it's kind of where things are heading. So as far as we're concerned, um, the growth of CBDC just makes the effectiveness of our network that much deeper and that much more extensive and also means we can deliver that value much more quickly. Now, we also um, believe that the, the fiat contingent, basically non-digital money, will be around for a very, very long time um, and may even be around you know, yeah, indefinitely, you just know how it's hard to predict how the industry will um, develop. So we're also very, very engaged with the uh, the leading central banks of the world um, to open accounts, settlement accounts, very similar to how you'd settle money if you were paying domestically, mm-hmm. so that whether it's a CBDC or whether it's um, traditional money, we can create that ultra safe repository that doesn't link to how healthy banks are in different countries around the world. And that's a really key point because that's one of the central reasons why before we started our project, that cross-border liquidity moving of money was so slow and so difficult. Yeah, yeah. Um, when you look at the you know official literature from somebody like the BIS or, or a body like that about cross-border payments, one of the big priorities they talk about is PVP, peer, uh, peer versus peer settlement, um, which I think is is quite closely tied to what you're talking about with atomic settlement, right? Like, um, and uh, that that you know it, expanding the ability to do more cross-border payments with a PVP settlement is a big uh, priority for them. Um, can you talk about RTS Global's role in that? And I guess also what, uh, beyond issuing a CBDC, what, what can central banks do to kind of facilitate innovation and, and in that area and make uh, PVP settlement more accessible for for, con- for company, uh, currencies where it's not accessible? Certainly. So um, put simply, RTS Global brings that idea to life. So you can think of our company as the, delivery method to make that ask or that requirement of BAS and the other um, leading global bodies come to life. So another word, as you say quite correctly for atomic settlement is PVP. So we deliver that PVP and the model we are creating fits very tightly with the model that the, um, the regulatory community wants to see uh, come into play. So that's really, really important. It's a good question. Thank you. Uh, I think I said peer versus peer, and I meant payment versus payment uh, for, for the P bit. It's okay. It's um, yeah. no real change. Peer versus peer, payment versus payment. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's well, actually a good way of thinking about what we're doing as well, to be honest. Um, can you talk about specific? You were talking about building a global network, and um, can you talk a little bit about any particular geographies uh, where there's uh, particular opportunities uh, for you? Uh, I think we've we've spoken in the past about Eastern Europe and uh, Asia, and Middle East. Um, yes. What are the the challenges there? Yes, well, the cross border problem is kind of um, let's say one third solved. So in the nineteen seventies. Um, and 1980s um, companies were created like Swift and CLS to make that cross-border process less painful. So CLS stands for Continued Linked Settlement, and it's a kind of banking solution covering the world's um, major currencies. There are 18 currencies, um, but they were the lead currencies back in the 80s, and since then others have come to a strength, for example, the Indian rupee, which is not covered by CLS. So if you look at the world, you kind of have, without oversimplifying it, a half-served portion where the solutions of CLS and uh, providers like them get some way to solving that problem. So you can't move your funds 24 by 7, you can't move them immediately, but they can be moved with less risk on CLS. And then you have another part of the world, um, which we used to call the emerging markets, but which are emerging 
very quickly and in many cases are very, very emerged. You can think of the BRICS conference going on right now um, in South Africa as an example. Those parts of the world are growing rapidly and are increasingly picking up the, the bulk of the world's GDP and population. They're underserved, they're not served by any legacy solution. And those solutions, because of their nature, are difficult to extend into those new countries. You can't just extend what we have in the Western world into the um, the new the future giants of the global economy. There's nothing. So that's why we are targeting parts of the world which are growing quickly, which are very innovative, creative, which have you know tremendously um, advanced fintech and digital uh, economies but which don't have any of the um, even, you know, part solutions for this cross-border problem. Mm -hmm. And I guess that, you know, any innovator coming to a market, you always go for the sectors with the greatest demand and who can move most quickly. Um, and that for us in the payment world is, um, is the whole Asian bloc, Africa, Middle East, Latin America. That's really where um, we think there's most impact from what we're doing right now. Excellent. And I, I'm aware you, you recently partnered with uh, MDO Humo and uh, Credo Banks. Um, can you talk about uh, those projects and um, I guess what, what the benefit for the customers of those institutions will be from this partnership? Yes, Credo Bank and Humo Bank represent the, uh, the pioneers that are initiating our network. So since that announcement, we've onboarded a couple more banks. We can't say who yet. We're running through the um, agreements with them. But the banks within that uh, Central Asia, Eastern European region. So what we want to do is get a network of around 20, which we should do by year end in that region, hopefully touching parts of Southeast Asia as well. And quite simply, we will start them making payments to each other settling immediately using small amounts but proving out the the value the impact of what we have created and then scale up and we want to create a couple of um starter networks so one in central asia eastern europe hopefully one in southeast asia quickly bring them together and link that to some of the larger networks that may take more time to come on board in the traditional western economies mm, very exciting um, and so you've mentioned a couple of times uh, this is very much a global project uh, that you're looking uh, that you're looking for here. Um, I know part of uh, delivering that part of your your strategy for kind of scaling that up globally is is a, a bank's working group that you've recently launched. Can you tell us a little a little bit about what what the goals are for for that? Yeah, so we're working with the uh, the most innovative and high impact banks in the um, in the industry. So we've created a working group of seventeen banks now. They're from all over the world. The um, I guess the common characteristic is they are a big multinational trading, transaction, foreign exchange banks. Banks that really uh, face this problem day to day. And the reason this group is so important is that it gives us the ability to really road test what we have designed with the leaders of the industry. So as well as working with the, you know, the fast starting, the emerging market banks, which move quickly, um, and which are in very, very fast moving economies, in parallel, we're working with the, the leaders of the industry um, and we're using those groups to help us really fine tune what we have and making sure that what we have created can really be used for impact by the, the leaders. And you know, as these banks come on board, this may take more time. These are bigger economies. These are more established um, uh, communities. But the potential to do great things with these uh, organizations is huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very exciting. So I guess looking more broadly at the the cross border settlement landscape, there's uh, you know I referenced the BIS earlier and they've got their committee for payment markets infrastructures with the uh, FSB and various other organisations involved in that and uh, there's kind of moving in parallel several different uh, potential solutions for 
uh, for cross-border payments, you know, there's Project Nexus, there's the stable coins and, and CBDCs that we've talked about before. Uh, and uh, yeah, there, there's quite a few different strategies here. Um, do you feel like we're moving towards a situation where all or, or some of these strategies coexist? Or is there a sense that once we get one of these right, the the need for the others is kind of eroded and, uh, and you know work is kind of abandoned in certain areas. Yeah, so we're facing um, what I call a longitude moment. If you think back to the um, the seventeen hundreds, where the um, the world shipping had no way of working out how far west or east they were, they could do north and south, but they couldn't do east or west. Um, and that was a general problem for a long time. It became a major problem when shipping was used for um, serious trade um, worldwide. So a lot of movement west and east to the Americas and uh, and to Asia. So it's a problem which was bubbling and then became very critical. There was a competition. There are many, many ideas. The winner was a very innovative and yet very elegant and looking back, quite simple solution compared to some of the other plays at the time. Mm. This is very, very similar. So in our context, the cross-border commercial world historically moved quite slowly. So large amounts of move between countries. Uh, trade was quite traditional. People didn't really buy you know, anything beyond the shop at the road. Nice and controlled. Things moved slowly. In the internet came along. Everything's digital. Things are moving much more quickly. The pressures now to solve that our version of the longer true problem, which is the uh, the cross border liquidity problem, is becoming more and more acute. So we're kind of waking up to a problem that's been there, but we have been living within the scope of that problem for a long time. Now we're outside that scope, and it's getting worse. So in that context, there are many many ways being touted to solve that problem. A number of them. I don't think we'll fly. And I think what we'll see is the more elegant, the more kind of Harrison clock type um, designs coming to the front. Now, clearly because of where I am and what I do and who I'm working with, I'm a strong believer in our model. I think we have a very good chance of leading that change again, because we have that great combination of an elegant solution that's workable, that's easily implemented and also creates that open ecosystem whereby as we succeed we help many more parties around the industry like those folks playing and developing um, cbdc's and um, stable coins we can be a great common glue for them to work with so yes it's a competition absolutely um, i think several ideas will um, fall away including some of the legacy um, um, providers who have a bigger job really to shift. So it's easy for us to come through with a new model and build and develop that model much harder if you are a traditional provider to move your proposition. So I think those guys have work to do. Um, and I feel very strongly that the model we have, because it's elegant, um, it's proven and um, it's simplicity I think gives us a really strong position in the um, you know the competition to lead the way through you know, a much better environment for the world. Mm. If you get this right, the impact isn't just about banks being able to move their money efficiently. And that's almost at the the foundational level. If that money's moving more efficiently, then it can move in smaller amounts. So it can make it possible for you to buy online in India, Pakistan, um, um, Kenya, Egypt, and have that transaction happen immediately with the price that's clear, the buyer, the seller, the onward seller, clarity of money, inclusion, you know, that kind of a model built on what we have created makes it possible for small companies to grow more quickly, address a global community versus a local community, it helps people to be re-engaged into the banking world. It ultimately helps fight against crime. It helps creativity. There's an awful lot of really high impact value 
that can be derived by solving this problem that you know and we're leading the field and we're very very excited about that and again that plays in quite neatly to the uh the bis and um yeah. later ask um for um a harrison moment if you like yeah yeah it's a really interesting point you make there about uh you know the legacy players have a lot of work to do but equally on the other side uh i feel like you know players that come in with a solution that's too disruptive uh they also have a lot of struggle to to get adoption because you can't uh require too much change of the existing players so i think that the kind of uh simplicity that you're talking about as uh is a big benefit in in getting adoption and it's a, a tricky balance between a new way of doing things but not too new and not not uh it doesn't require too much change you're absolutely right and it's um i think this kind of reality that if you're coming in with something very new you've got a big hurdle to get over because the industry is locked into an old way of doing things that kind of friction tends to be counterbalanced by a buildup in, of pressure for change in an old system. So if you look at all of the major shifts through history, uh, from steam to um, to uh, an internal combustion engine, um, or from uh, landlines to mobile, uh, radio to TV, they all happened when there was a, a real build up and uh, a real kind of like explosion in demand and necessity it just wasn't met by the old system and i think we're in that um inflection point now so we're in a world where although you know we're asking banks to look completely freshly at something they've been doing for a long long time in a certain way mm-hmm. and as you said that's a big deal that's very different to saying hey i've developed an app that helps you look after your, I don't know, your 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 HR policy. You can install the app, you can be a hero, very simple. We're different. We're working at the, the foundation level. Yeah. But because the pain associated with today's world is getting so great, I think players like RTGS Global, that's why we're seeing so much traction, why we have a banking group of 17 of the biggest players in the world that you know are, are deeply, deeply embedded. And deeply um, um, you know, connected, emotionally connected, and financially connected to the legacy models, while they're looking really hard at something different, because you kind of got that inflection point. Um, mm-hmm. It's a case, really, of you know, banks' ability to remain relevant and to remain um, value add players in a global economy. They're really going to solve this problem. Um, the world is a global village. You can't say. I'm a bank in the UK, that's enough. You can't say I'm a bank in France, that's enough. Um, you're a global village. Yeah. Yeah, that pressure you're referring to, I think, uh, you know, as you were talking about with the the kind of explosion of global e-commerce, uh, yeah, it's it does, it certainly feels like that has kind of catalyzed uh um, uh, a really dynamic period of change in cross-border payments at the moment. There's uh, so much, so much work going on in so many different directions, and as you say, not all of them will prove fruitful. But I think the the number of them speaks to the demand that you're that you're talking about. Um, yes. I think we'll have to leave it there. But uh, thank you for a fascinating discussion. Thanks for thanks for joining us, Marcus. Great to have you. My pleasure. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to all our listeners and viewers for tuning in today. Uh, do check out our website, onfifth.org, for details of any upcoming events and reports. We have a, a report on digital assets launching at the end of September. Uh, you can subscribe to our podcast on Spotify or Podbean, uh, and we've got a YouTube channel as well. Uh, so you can and follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn to make sure you're up to date with all of our latest news. Thanks again for listening. Goodbye. Thank you.